Welcome to session six of lesson two, three, four. And uh, we are going to talk about the gastrointestinal system now. We'll be talking about the condition pyloric stenosis and perforated peptic ulcer in this session. So this is going to be very, very um, brief because it's going to draw from the general pre and post operative care that we have uh, discussed earlier in this course. So when we take pyloric stenosis, what is it? Ideally, it's supposed to be discussed under pediatric. The stomach as an organ has the pylorus, which leads to the uh, duodenum and then to the small intestines, etc. So the pyloric area is well labeled in the diagram I picked from the nets and put there for you. So it is supposed to be patent for the food to move from the, should I say the lesser cavity into the pylorus out. The pylorus is the part that um, leads into the duodenum, okay? And normally this part is supposed to be patent for your food to move from the lesser cavity of the stomach into the pyloric region out. Now, for pyloric stenosis, the place is narrowed to the extent that sometimes no food is even able to pass through into the duodenum. So everything that the child takes is in the stomach, and then a child vomits, and the vomiting comes out, and I see it's a projectile uh, type of vomiting. So that is briefly about the condition. Now, it's realize that more um, males, male children are more affected than uh, females and has some genetic predisposition. Now, what you used to see that a child has this problem is the fact that the child is not able to feed well and the abdomen is so full, kind of distended. The child is crying a lot and is vomiting with a forceful um, projection of the vomitus and that is how and the child is always projecting as hungry hungry remember that when you eat and the food goes into the stomach it doesn't enter the blood from there it has to be digested and then the end product of digestion is absorbed into the blood so the child eating doesn't mean that the child that the, the, the cells have the nutrients so that is how come the child is always uh, hungry uh, with abdominal pain, vomiting, <coughs> belching, hunger. I mentioned all these things already. So the doctor would examine the child, would do a scan, an barium uh, examination, s and then a blood test. So when this is done, the child is prepared for surgery and the specific surgical procedure for pyloric stenosis is called Ramstead surgery procedure and it's also called pyloromyotomy where they try to expand the um, the stenosed, the narrowed, the closed pyloric lumen. Okay. So when the surgery is done, um, of course, the prognosis is good. Um, you prepare the mother, the child for the theater. You see, so you see from here on, if your uh, session one, two, three, thereabouts is not strong, then you are now confused. For surgery, once you have the normal things, the general things that you have to do, you add to it. So this is a child, you involve the mother. And of course, the child has no hair. So what are you going to shave anyway? Unless you tell me that the baby has hair, then I, I, I will be surprised. So you, decongest the general that you know for a specific condition as much as possible. So, um, so the, nest, the nursing care, I've put down a few things for you just to help you, remind you. And because of that, I will not say all of them. I just say that you monitor the skin for dehydration and then you, you give the child the IV fluids as much as possible. And um, when the baby comes back from the theater, of course, you session the baby, nail per us until the brows are working 
and then you take care of the wound, all that. Slides I've given you um, is descriptive enough to give you more information from that. Then the second section, uh, this session also involves um, ulcers. And practical ulcer will be discussed in medicine. Uh, Dr. Kosa will talk to you about uh, peptic ulcer. Now, what is important about a surgery is the fact that a severe ulcer, which is untreated, can perforate the cardia, the upper part of the stomach, the greater curvature, and then the duodenal area towards the small intestine. So when this happens, then we have to go and either cut that part off and kind of join the remaining, or depending on the situation. If you are unlucky to get all three in one person, then you have to take the whole stomach off, total gastrectomy. But usually people are lucky, we get partial gastrectomies most of the time. So um, because you have done peptic ulcer in um, medicine, what I have here is additional information for you to read to add to what you know about ulcers. So I've also taken the trouble to put in a table that distinguishes um, duodenal ulcer and gastric ulcer. The ulcer can be in the duodenum or the ulcer can be in the stomach. I've distinguished that for you, but I'm saying that I'll stay within the domain of surgery as much as possible. So the clinical manifestations are also listed the pharmacologic treatment for ulcer patients is also listed and all that. So when we come to perforated peptic ulcer, which is where my interest is, is where I'll stay there for a while. Now I mentioned that's a while ago that it occurs from untreated peptic ulcer. So when it's, it happens, the patient may have sudden severe upper abdominal pain. Okay and sometimes it radiates to the shoulders. The person will be vomiting blood, or if it's a perforated um, duodenal ulcer, you may see blood in so which is usually hidden. So we say malina. When you touch the abdomen, it's very tender and rigid, and the patient will not want you to touch it, so there's garden person doesn't want to eat and losing weight. So we do a series of investigations and then we take the patient to the theater. Usually they will open up the abdomen, abdominal wall, and depending on where the um, ulcer has perforated, some options are available. One of them is what we call a bit of one surgery. In this one, it's also called gastroduodenostomy, and the lower portion of the antrum of the stomach are removed, as well as the pylorus. So the the lower part of the stomach, that's where the uh, the ulcer is, is removed. So the upper part is now joined to the duodenum. So in this case, you see that the patient doesn't have any uh, pylorus to control the movement of food. And such a patient is prone to what we call, um, like you eat the food and it will rush into the small intestine. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. The second type of surgery is gastro So you can see, the ulcer will be at the duodenal area. So they move the parts that is disease out, and then you now anastomose the stomach into the jejunum. Now they can also do a plastic surgery of the um, affected area and also do a pegotomy if it's a nerve overstimulation issue. So the preparation, as in the psychological, the physical, and the physiological, are all things that we have discussed and whatever is specific, let's add to, the, to, to it. Now, postoperatively, this is abdominal surgery. So you pass NG2 for continuous drainage. 
you give the patient catheter, you pass catheter also. And then you add the other postoperative care. So you do the um, catheter pre-op, patient comes back, you have to clean the catheter as well, in addition to the wound. And when you have an abdominal um, surgical patient, you don't want the wound to gape. So you teach the patient how to uh, cough and brace the abdomen. So you use the palm to put on the abdomen when you are coughing to give it some pressure so that the wound will not gape. You teach the patient how to do that. Deep breathing and coughing exercises to make sure that the patient is okay. Now, I mentioned a while ago that when you have the bit of one surgery, there's high likelihood of um, the food rushing from the stomach into the small intestine because of the absence of the pylorus, okay? Now, that phenomenon of having the food rush down is what we call dumping syndrome. And when you go into your nursing dictionary, you find the meaning of dumping syndrome. A person becomes very restless, will be sweating. Sometimes they are a little, um, they want to go into shock. So the patient should just lie down. Peristasis normalizes the patient to be fine. So in this regard, because of the effect of gravity, the person is not supposed to eat heavy food at a time. You eat small intervals. And when you finish eating, you don't just get up at a, um, at a go. You wait for a while, 10, 15 minutes um, before you get up. And if not, you continue having dumping syndrome more frequently, you know. If you take good care of yourself, it, it doesn't happen often, once in a while. So that is something that you have to remember to tell the patient. And of course, a patient will come for a regular review. Thank you.